started here. You'll see uh, two sheets in front of you, a pink one and the white one. Pink one in pastels because uh, we're going to be taking a look at 2 Peter and Jude. over the course of uh, the spring here. You'll see the dates there uh, and each date given uh, some verses that we'll be looking at and a little title. The key word is hope. We'll talk a little bit about hope here today just to kind of get a sense of um, what we're looking for. Isn't it interesting that whenever you read something, you actually have to know what you're going to be reading before you even look at the first word. So you have this sense of what you're approaching. Okay? And there's a lot of um, issues that are uh, kind of combined together. So the genre of uh, what you're going to be reading, if it's a math textbook, that's one thing. If it's a history textbook, it's a, something else. If it's a poem, it's something else entirely. So. You already have to, in a sense, kind of know what you're looking for before you even uh, look at the first letter. So here, uh, this uh, pink outline here, uh, today we're looking at the Great Apostles' Last Testament, purpose and place of the letter. We're only looking at two verses. Uh, we'll have plenty of things to uh, talk about to introduce our study here. Um, and we're going to find it interesting that uh, a lot of times we will be looking at scripture. And uh, we'll each, actually each week I'd like to give you a little bit of a kind of a focused, quick kind of nugget about the Lutheran view and understanding of scripture. Also, I do have a request from you. I would like us to be able to start each class going forward with someone from uh, the group kind of giving us a quick reminder of what we looked at the prior week, or something that stood out, maybe even a question, although I'll warn you, a question means that we might uh, you know, need a little bit lengthier uh, explanation, and we only have the 45 minutes. But if you're able to just kind of summarize, or if there was a main point that really stood out, um, that's what I'd like to hear from you, and then we'll get started in that week's uh, particular uh, lesson. So you can keep this uh, per, uh, pink sheet and just bring it with you. The white sheet, each week I'll give you one of these. Uh, I know Pastor Moss did this uh, for you as well. And I guess that's uh, a place to start. Uh, First Peter is, uh, is a, a right weighty epistle. Luther wouldn't view it that way. It's a... Uh, one of the New Testament books that he includes among the chief books of the New Testament. So the Gospels, but particularly John, Paul's epistles, but especially Romans. And 1 Peter is always in that list of uh, the chief books of the New Testament in, in Luther's uh, reckoning. The interesting thing is that the early church also uh, did that. So we're moving into 2 Peter and Jude, and through the course of our study, we'll see there's an interesting, very interesting connection between 2 Peter and the very short book of Jude. Jude is so short, it has only one chapter. You don't have chapter 1, verse 3. It just, you're just told Jude 3, which means verse 3. So Jude and 2 Peter, especially the second chapter of 2 Peter, uh, bear a very interesting connection. We're going to be delving into that. Uh, mid-April. So we've got three weeks here in March, then comes Easter, for first Sunday in April, three weeks between Easter and Confirmation, and then three weeks after Confirmation before Memorial Day. So that's kind of our time parameters here. Uh, so uh, both Second Peter and Jude are what are called antilogomena, Books that in the early church were not uh, universally and fully uh, accepted by literally everybody. So there was a little pocket of the church that had some issues with some of the books in the New Testament. Uh, so, let's see, Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. So those are the seven. Uh, and so it was really the area kind of in Syria... 
that area of the church, so that's like uh, Damascus, where Paul was going to arrest Christians. And then farther north from Damascus is Antioch, which is the capital city. Uh, that's where Paul had most of his ministry. That's the church that sent him and Barnabas on their first journey. They returned back to report what had, God had accomplished through them. And then, so that's the sending church, a major church in the, uh, the early days of the Christian church. So Antioch. So Syria was a region where some of these books, um, the issue was mostly has to, had to do with, was this written by an apostle? Okay. And the reason there was a little hesitancy in Syria was partly because a lot of the issues that these books are um, dealing with and the way in which they deal with them um, were very sore spots in the, this, the churches of this region at, in the second century. So in 100, going from 100 to about the year 200, and even the year 300. So while the rest of the church is just, you know, coming right along, uh, and they even have more books than what we have in our New Testament canon, kind of on the edges, on the periphery. Okay? Um, and so the, the, all the other books of the New Testament are called Homo Lumina. Which means they were universally accepted everywhere. Um, the interesting thing is that even in Syria, uh, when they were making a Syriac translation of the Greek New Testament about the year 600, all these books that were, had some hesitancy around them, all of them were accepted in, okay, and included with all the rest. What that means for Lutherans, and actually the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, back in Walter's day and even today, we still accept this kind of distinction. And part of it is um, every doctrine has a particular verse where it is uh, seated. Okay, it's called the seat of doctrine. And it's, it's like the, the proving passage or passages. And so for us as Lutherans, no... Uh, Doctrine can be uh, find its only proof in one of these books. Okay? Now, usually, you'll have uh, what's taught in these books uh, is also taught in these books. And these will have multiple verses that deal with a particular topic. Okay? Um, the thing that I always find interesting about this distinction is that it does not rely on lists. Okay, so our Reformed friends, uh, they always, uh, in fact, in their confessions, they list, these are the books of the Bible. We don't have that in the Book of Concord. Okay? For Luther and for Luther, the Lutheran Church, the key actually is um, the use. Okay? So it's not you know, um, appealing to a list that was made. Uh, there's a bunch of lists in the early church. There's a document called the uh, Muratorian Canon from the year 200 that has a lot of, it's a Latin, it has a lot of, it has a list of these. Athanasius, bishop in Alexandria, sent a letter, an Easter letter, he would do this annually to fix the date for Easter. So he'd send it out to the churches of Egypt. And uh, in his letter for 367, he lists all the books of the New Testament. And it's basically just exactly what you'll find in your table of contents. So there are lists that float around, but for the Lutheran Church, that's not where we put all of our eggs. We want to put all of our eggs in actually the use of Scripture today, right now, by the church, proving doctrine, comforting sinners, teaching the faith, both young and old. Okay? And so it's the actual use and engagement and connection, the preaching, the teaching, of Scripture is really where we tend to, to put our our focus. So, top of the white sheet here, uh, the Great Apostles' Last Testament, purpose and place of the letter. In Luke 22, Jesus uh, told Peter, warned him, that he would deny his master three times before the rooster crowed twice. But, Jesus said, I am praying for you, okay, and when you turn back, or are converted, strengthen your brothers. So Peter's ministry, the book of Acts, we see that, the first days of the church, and then um, these letters were written toward the end of his ministry. All right. 
First Peter strengthens those facing persecution by teaching Christian hope. There's the key word. That's not the one I want. Uh, Christian hope. That's why Pastor Moss and I gravitated very strongly to these books for this spring. And we'll talk about hope just momentarily, but strengthen those facing persecution where you want to give up hope, the pressure gets intense, but strengthens those facing persecution by teaching not just hope, but Christian hope. Second Peter, why does he write another letter? Strengthens and warns those who hold, uh, whose hold on Christian hope is weakening. So you, it's not just something you say once and then that's it. But we need this constant reminder, constant encouragement of the scriptures. And actually, that leads me, uh, let's open with a prayer, a collect for the study of the word before we study the word. Pastor Briel always just prays this from memory when we gather as pastors. Uh, we always start with the Hebrew. He prays this prayer, and then he leads us right into uh, the Old Testament Hebrew. So um, I, th this prayer is in my ears. Uh, I've heard it many, many times. So let's join in this prayer. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So hope. Let's go to Hebrews 11, verse 1. I just want to touch on this kind of overarching theme, both of 1 Peter and 2 Peter. A little bit different situations of the addressees. So Hebrews is before 2 Peter's there. 2 Peter. Hebrews 11, verse 1. And if you had to give an answer, um, what is hope, or especially Christian hope, you probably are going to be very kind of future directed. So not going by what you see right here now or what you feel, but by what you hear, what God has promised. So promise is a key word when it comes to hope. Remember Abraham and Sarah, they received God's promise, they had to wait, but they waited in faith, and so God counted that as righteousness, and they believed him and when he spoke to them, when he made that promise to them. Abraham believed it, God said, that's righteousness right there, to believe my word, what I'm saying, what I'm promising, though you can't see it yet. Okay. So Hebrews 11, uh, let's just read that together. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So faith and hope really belong together and have a lot of similar characteristics. Uh, faith is the assurance of things that are hoped for, the certainty, the conviction of things that are not seen. Paul in Romans says, hope that is seen is not hope. Okay? So the moment you see it, then hope just vanishes. All right, so the moment that Christ raises us from the dead, brings us into heaven on the last day uh, uh, for that Jerusalem above, hope will no longer characterize us because it will give way to sight. We'll actually be experiencing and seeing everything God has said, everything he has promised. We'll actually have it uh, in reality, not only in faith and in hope. So faith will fall away. We won't need it anymore. Hope will vanish but like Paul says, love always endures. Okay? Love will characterize our whole life uh, in that Jerusalem above. Go to 1 Peter uh, 3. So just as hope is a theme in 2 Peter, it's also a, a major theme in 1 Peter. Actually, uh, while you're turning to 1 Peter, or 1 Peter 1, I see uh, pretty regularly on the internet, on Facebook, uh, a lot of former teachers of mine, uh, and a lot of fellow pastors kind of commenting on things going on. And over and over again, I'm seeing 
You know, First Peter is a book for our time. Um, Dr. Weinrich uh, made a comment like that, and so Pastor Moss and I you know, wanted to zero in First Peter, First Peter, and now these uh, also accompanying letters. So First Peter one verse three. This is how, after the introduction, Peter begins the letter, the body of the letter, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I always love that, that pairing. By the way, that's going to be something you're going to notice, in, and actually I want you to focus on in 2 Peter. Peter and the people who wrote here um, like to use doublets, okay, pairs, words that are paired with each other. So that's kind of how he thinks and speaks. Jude, uh, who has very similar content as Second Peter, we'll see that later, he likes to use threes, triplets. And we're going to notice that if you see threes, it's probably Jude. If you see twos, it's probably Peter. But here, I love this uh, connection here. So a living hope living hope, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those two belong together. Okay. It's not empty hope. Uh, Paul says our uh, Christian hope does not disappoint us because this is most certainly true and this gives rise to Christian hope it gives rise to the apostolic office and preaching of the gospel it gives rise to the written New Testament the resurrection of Christ is the source that is unshakable even when the world ends of all the good things God has for us. So I like how he just kind of pairs these uh, because they belong together. 1 Peter 1, verse 21. So that'll take us uh, toward the end of the chapter. So Christ the Lamb without blemish or spot was foreknown before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So again, resurrection, uh, Peter always puts that right in front. And then Romans 5. This too talks about hope, but also um, kind of talks about our Christian life now as we hold fast to this hope, but our Christian life now and our discipleship going forward day by day, following Christ, carrying the cross as he bids us, Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. There's just a couple passages in the New Testament talking about hope. It's a vital part of the Christian life, um, and it's a gift from God to you. There in the middle of that white sheet, you see, uh, let's get back to 2 Peter now. There in the middle of the sheet, you see uh, Luther took up 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and Jude. And you've got the dates there. The scholars did great work, and kind of look through notes and look through, you know, Luther traveled a lot, so he was gone, you know, maybe there at the end of January, which caused him to miss a week, okay? Uh, so there you just see uh, how he took up Second Peter and then later Jude. 
so what's the problem here? So we say, we've said that the overarching theme is hope. What is the problem that is putting stress on believers so that Peter is urged uh, to address the problem? So there in that middle paragraph, you see what scholars today kind of view as the problem. Peter is dealing with in this epistle as libertinism. So freedom. It's actually a very false freedom. And freedom of the flesh, which actually is slavery. Um, like Jesus says in John 8, um, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. But notice the difference here, the contrast in mindset. Those who promote this, even within the churches. So 2 Peter, as we read through, we're going to get the sense that the opponents that he is addressing are actually located inside the congregations. Whereas Jude, you get the sense that they're coming from outside. Now, they're, they're trying to come in, but they're coming from outside. Either way, similar issue of libertinism. Oh, uh, has it? Leah has it. Oh, there. Notice that this mindset here is really focused on the present, the here and now. What about hope? what Peter wants to bring to the hearers through God's promises and Christ's resurrection. Where's the focus there? On what's coming. Not right here and now what I want or feel, but what's been promised and what is coming. Yeah. Okay. And so that's a strong contrast right there between those who are holding and promoting this view of life and what the gospel brings. Now that's a temptation, isn't it? Uh, Luther addresses that uh, in his comments on these books. You know, the gospel is now here, and people now are using it as an excuse. Okay, I don't, I don't have to do good works. I'm saved by faith. So I don't have to do good works. I can really live how I want. Okay. Um, and so... What the modern scholars are addressing, Luther is also addressing, but he's doing it, I would say, in a fuller picture. He is, so they're looking at this contrast between here and here. Luther is looking at also faith and uh, good works. So the moderns are doing this, Luther is doing that. He's got, it, he's got it all. He puts this inside of a bigger issue. All right. Um, libertinism is throughout the New Testament. It's addressed. Uh, and I, I would say, just as a fan of the early church, um, what happens is this gets promoted as, even in philosophical circles before this, you know, 300 years before this, this is something that the lazy philosophers would promote. Okay? And they try to come up with a system to give respectability to, to their um, promotion there. Um, something similar in the early church. And so in the first century, uh, you've got people promoting this. And after the year 100, what you start to see is people trying to give a, a rationale, a bigger picture, of why this should be. So they start, that's called Gnosticism. Okay. This uh, special secret knowledge and the, uh, the view of God is uh, definitely not the biblical or creedal view. Uh, so they develop this whole really mythology of God and of how you come to know his unfolding um, all as a support for this. All right, um, so look at 1 verse 1. 
this letter of Peter is not all that unlike other New Testament letters, and it's not all that unlike other Greek letters of the day. I wrote a new, um, newsletter article, I think it was last summer, on 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, in that we talked about how Christian epistles, what we know as the books of the New Testament, so Romans, 1st Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, etc., these letters are actually very, very long compared to other Greek letters. Uh, but they all typically begin with uh, how a normal Greek letter would begin. They begin with the sender, the addressee, and the greeting. And actually, this one, I, I didn't know this until just recently, but that one is not always present in Greek letters. So a Greek letter most typically will just have the writer, and then, so he'll say uh, his name, and then greetings. That's it. Okay. Uh, the New Testament, you've got the author, the sender, and you've got the congregation that is being addressed, or a group of Christians. And I think that's uh, partly in a sense for sake of authentication. I, I, I need to think more about this, because I just learned this recently, that I always assume that Greek letters have this, you know, uh, but they typically just have these two. And a Greek letter will have just the word greetings. The thing about these New Testament epistles is they take the opportunity to expand this opening salutation. So Peter is going to be saying some important things about himself here, so he's not just going to say his name. And he's going to be saying some important things about his addressees. And in the greeting, what he, uh, these New Testament epistles do is they take the opportunity to talk about the Trinity and salvation. So they encapsulate key uh, realities of our salvation in Christ, even in just this greeting. So they expand the greeting from what it normally looks like. So verses 1 and 2, let's just uh, listen to those. I'll read them here quick, and then we'll uh, make our way through. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle, look at the two right there, of Jesus Christ, to those who have, have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's double it again, too. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So there's the opening salutation. Um, who is being addressed here? We don't get a group, we don't get a church named, we don't get a, a geopolitical region named. So Bithynia, that first Peter addressed this region in modern day Turkey, central Turkey. Um, we don't get that here. But if you go to chapter 3, I'll just give you a chance to read that, and then I'll ask you a question. Especially that first sentence there, chapter 3, verse 1. What does that tell us? Yeah, so the first letter, the addressees found in that first letter, now have a second letter coming their way, even though they're not specified in the opening salutation. We get that from in the body of the letter. Okay. Um, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, is Peter's own statement of the problem. So this is not the modern scholars. This is not even Dr. Luther. This is what Peter is putting in his letter of what he wants to address. So let's read uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And let's read it together. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, 
that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. So we're going to talk about the scoffers following their own desires. That's that libertinism again, and they encourage others to do the same. Um, you see that doubling, Lord and Savior. Okay, it doesn't just say Lord Jesus or our Savior, Lord and Savior. Okay. Uh, so let's go back to uh, chapter 1. Verses 12 and 15. This, this uh, set of verses, just like the ones we just read, show Peter's purpose, namely to give a reminder. Um, and it's kind of like with your baptism. So remember your baptism. It's not that you remember, so that's not like I remember back to May 1976, because I was an infant at that time, I was just born. But to remember your baptism means this is what's true right now. Okay? So the same thing here. Uh, Paul, Peter's offering a reminder, but it's not think back in the past and in the mists of history and of your own personal history in your life. Uh, think of something that was true then. No, it's something that was true then, but it's true now. And so remember in that sense. So chapter 1, verses 12 and 15, 12 through 15. So let's read these together. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. The interesting thing about 1 Peter, 2 Peter, Jude, some of these uh, things toward the end of the Old Testament, they start to reflect on Scripture. Paul's just, in the early days, he's just writing letters, okay? But then toward the end of his life, he starts, like in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, he starts to kind of get a little distance, and this is the Word of God. The prophets wrote the Word of God, and as an apostle of Jesus Christ, I too have written the Word of God. Now, he's aware of it, and sometimes he has to argue it uh, in the letters, but these later letters, they, they reflect back on this reality. And so these verses here are, are quite important, I would say, because they show us that there was a natural reality that so the, the apostles were going to be dying. And taking cognizance of their office and the responsibility they bear, charged from Christ, that is one of the impelling factors toward writing the word down. Instead of just preaching and teaching, they also wrote it down and we know it as the New Testament books. Okay. And Peter actually verbalizes that very thing right here. So it's not something we kind of determine with just kind of thinking up about it, but it's actually included here. All right, uh, if you want to flip the white sheet there. Um, the book of Revelation is interesting because it too, in the final chapter, chapter 22, starts talking this kind of way, kind of in a formal way, about the scriptures and about writing. It says, if anyone takes, you know, from these, from these uh, books, uh, we'll, we'll have eternal life taken from them. If anyone adds to these words, they will have the plagues that are described in this book added to them. Okay? So notice how it's at the end. So Revelation or... Uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy in Paul's writings, 1 Peter, 2 Peter in uh, Peter's writings at the end of his life. It's at the end where these kinds of things are being thought about and articulated and warnings. Okay? And actually, in Revelation 22, it's not just for the book of Revelation, but it's really kind of like a conclusion to the whole, all of Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. Um, so 2 Peter 1, verse 21 
Peter here, and when we get to this verse, we'll spend more time on it, but just uh, to bring it be to your attention here already, so Peter's reflecting on uh, inspiration. Okay. So remember this prayer. Blessed Lord, you have caused all Holy Scriptures to be written. Why? For our learning. Caused is a general word. The technical word is inspiration. Okay. Cause in that sense. And in the Lutheran Church in Missouri, and actually this came up with our, my seventh graders this week, we're looking at the resurrection of Christ, Mark 16, and uh, one of the boys raised his hand and said, Pastor, why is there this note in the text of that most early manuscripts do not include these final verses. We had to uh, dive into all that. But um, inspiration is not of, um, so Peter here, he's inspired um, to then write as he sees fit. But really he's inspired in the sense that the words are inspired. So the very words are given to him. And I wanted to kind of take a look at some uh, passages where um, theological argument is made in the scriptures based on a single word, which one of the things that means is that the scriptures regard themselves as being inspired in that kind of way, that even a single word has weight. So for example, uh, Paul in Galatians talks about seed, and that it's singular, referring to Christ. Or Jesus in um, John's Gospel uh, says, why does David call him Lord? He's his son. Um, and then there's, I'm trying to remember the other one that I had uh, taken a look at. But uh, the, even just one single word can bear uh, the weight there. 2 Peter 3, verse 15. Oh, no, we've got to do 121. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So he is the author. It's the Holy Spirit's book. That's how Luther loved to talk. Um, 2 Peter 3, 15. Notice again, this is at the end of the book, or the letter. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. Uh, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the what? Other scriptures. Other scriptures. So what's Peter saying here about Paul's writings? They are part of scripture. Right. So these little cross-references are actually vital. And again, that's really what I think, as I said earlier, as Lutherans, when we're approaching the canon, okay, a list is just fine, but notice how it's done here. Okay? There's the content. There's the way in which it's being uh, distorted, and so Peter's correcting. Okay? And so it's actually being used. And the hearers that Peter's addressing actually know and have read what Paul has written. Okay. So it's being used, not just a list over there somewhere. All right, uh, 2 Timothy 3, uh, we'll get to that later. We need to keep going. There's a little note there about the word for Scripture in that 2 Peter 3. Uh, it always refers to the canonical Old Testament Scriptures and not to any, not to any other writings. And except for twice, here and in 1 Timothy 5.18, uh, some New Testament era writings are also included. Okay. So here, Paul's writings are included, and in 1 Timothy 5, uh, Paul's writings are included okay, in what we mean by Scripture. So it's not just the Old Testament. That's what it normally means. Okay. Some notes on 1, 1 to 2, and we have two minutes. Uh, this opening salutation... Uh, if you go back to uh, the first two verses. Um, sender, recipients, and greeting. Um, 
When we talk about this, they move beyond just pleasantries and expand into Trinitarian Christological doxology. Um, and I had you look at uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 23. There's a letter there from the Apostolic Council. We won't go there. But that letter is, is the very brief thing. Uh, it just gives greetings. Okay, so it looks like a normal uh, Greek letter. Um, look at that third bullet point. I want to really emphasize this. Things we will be looking for in 2 Peter. These are things you might want to bring up okay, at the start of class next Sunday from this first chapter. So one thing would be uh, how the salutation is expanded to include the Trinity. That's a big key thing. Um, hopox legomenon, or things that are said once. So this, uh, throughout 2 Peter, there's going to be a vocabulary which only appears right here. That makes it a challenge because you don't have a whole range of other uses to compare to gain the, the sense of the meaning. So if it only happens once, then that causes a little, a little bit of an issue, although sometimes it will appear in other literature, Greek literature. But if it's only here in the New Testament, then that can be a struggle. But it also means that the hearers are likely to, um, hopefully, uh, their attention kind of is gotten by this word. And then another thing is the pairs. We talked about that, the doubling. Um, so chapter 1, he gives uh, Simeon Peter. Uh, again, he gives two names. Simeon was his birth name from his mother. Peter was his nickname from Jesus. Simeon was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Uh, Simeon is a Hebrew word that comes from Shema, which means to listen. Okay. So Simeon means to listen. Peter means rock. And he calls himself a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. So a servant of God, a servant of Jesus, and an apostle. So apostle is a unique office that Christ uh, created and instituted. Uh, and uh, we know a couple things about that. Uh, to those who have t obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, I think Pastor Moss uh, um, emphasized also that in 1 Peter, Peter was always including, so he, he called himself a fellow elder. He didn't say, I'm an apostle above you, but he said, I'm a fellow elder, so with the other pastors. All right? Here he's saying, uh, all Christians share the same faith. Okay? To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, that word for obtain or receive is one of these hop hox legomenon words, so words that occur only once. Okay? Um, and it's, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, it's, uh, no it's not. It's used in Luke 1 and Acts chapter 1. It uh, means to be given a divine blessing or privilege without any merit on your part. So it's a very strong grace word. Uh, I do want to definitely talk about this next part. Uh, standing, uh, of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, in English, this is a little ambivalent, or it could be. You could understand it as, by the righteousness of our God, meaning the Father, and Savior Jesus Christ. But the way uh, the Greek is actually uh, working here, these are nouns that are not names of a certain persons, but they're uh, nouns that are names um, generally. And there's an article here, we think of like the definite article, the word the, actually in Greek if you could translate it, uh, equal standing with ours by the righteousness of the God, our God, and Savior Jesus Christ. So there's a little, little Greek word here called an article that makes this definite. That's one of the things it can do. But the article is not repeated here. So with this little and in between, what it's doing is this word and this word are referring to the same person. Okay. So that's what nouns do. Um, pronouns, you know, you have to find out who's the antecedent, what's the referent here. Nouns actually are the same thing. It's a little more put to the front, 
but they actually are referring to someone or something. You have to determine, well, what is it? So here, God and Savior, because of the way it's written, so without the article here, means these two are referring to the same reference. And then here's a proper noun name and a title here. And these are in apposition to, to that one. So it's actually, all of these are referring to the same person. Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay. Now it's interesting that this next one, verse 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Here, God... God is referring to the Father. Okay. So you've got... Um, this Trinitarian reality. So Christology, doxology here for Christ, and then the Trinitarian doxology, namely God our Father and our Jesus our Lord. And the reason we know that this one is not connected here in the same way that this one is, uh, is because this is a proper name. So that is the reason why uh, that's not a proper name. So that moves it out of this kind of way of uh, writing. All right, so let's see. Uh, maybe one final thing, the second to last bullet point. Knowledge is going to be key, uh, key theme. So in verse two, in his salutation, his opening salutation, he highlights this word. Then in the very next verse, the body of the letter, he uses it again, and in some following verses. We probably are going to need to touch on that when we take those following verses uh, next Sunday. But um, let's close with the college for uh, this day. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. And though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. God's peace be with you.